Here's my one slide sleep, sleep uh, course. And Barry will do a little, a little, probably a little more, but <laughs> sleep goes in four stages. I show this to the patient. One, two, three, four. Three and four are more of the deep restorative sleep. One, you're sort of passing out. You go to two. There's a transition to three and four where most people sort of squeeze their jaws together for a little while. Then you drop into three and four. Then you kind of have REM dreaming and you start over at two. Drop down. Oh, you clench your jaw a little bit. Oh, three and four. Between stage two and stage three, some people don't just squeeze their jaws. They clench them really, really hard. And it almost prevents you from dropping into three and four sometimes. You don't get deep restorative sleep. You just, you just, you work out and you start over in stage two, and you work out, and then you come back to stage two. And as the night progresses around 2.30, 3, 34 in the morning, these, these episodes are getting a little longer and more intense. Sometimes they'll go to bed at 10 o'clock and they gotta get at one in the morning for some goofy reason and their headache isn't nearly as bad as it normally is. Oh, tomorrow's gonna be great. They go back to sleep, they wake up at seven o'clock with a headache again. And it's all part of this. It's a, I tell the patients, this clenching, grinding business is like a writer on a policy. It just gets stuck in there. Sometimes it's there, sometimes it's not. They go, well, I said, do you ever, do you ever have to get up to go to the bathroom? Do you ever have a weird dream? Do you ever wake up feeling refreshed? Do you ever wake up feeling lousy? Does your sleep ha happen the exact same every single night? Well, no. Neither does your clenching episodes. They change all over the place. They're not, it's not an exact all the si same thing. And if they, and during this transition, as they're now transitioning out of this entire sleep cycle, the longer they lay there in bed with their eyes closed, they're not sleeping, but they're faking, sort of feeling like they are, the longer they lie there, the longer their teeth are probably touching. The intensity isn't nearly as bad as it could be, but then now we're looking at a duration problem. So the goal is, I'll tell patients, when you wake up and you know you're not sleeping, get out of bed. Wake up, get up because they'll have what they call weekend stress letdown migraine. No kidding, it's an absolute diagnosis. That the patient says, I get my worst migraines on the weekends. Well, tell me about, so it's stress, stress letdown, like your brain's just waiting to punish you because you had a hard week, and just on the weekend, I'm really gonna nail you and your life sucks. So we had a guy at a seminar we did in Solana Beach about a month ago, and this guy had these raging migraines on the weekends. On the weekdays, he was fine. So I said to him, what do you do for a living? Well, I work at the county yard on the school buses. What time do you get to, get to work? 4.30 in the morning? <laughs> yeah. You don't get up that early on the weekend, do you? No way. Sleeps till all the way to seven. <laughs> so I want to add primary clenching to our list of temporal mandibular disorders. It's the one TMD that has no signs and symptoms of a mandible or teeth being messed up. But it's probably the most common of all. Waking with a headache is not unusual to practically all the time. When I ask a patient in the migraine clinic, on a scale of zero to 10, 10 is the worst pain you can, dis worst discomfort above the shoulders. Don't give them any specifics. Discomfort above the shoulders. And I, th I do this. <laughs> Where a 10 is the worst you can imagine, a zero is you feel fabulous. How many mornings a week do you wake with a zero? You know, you feel fabulous. And then I don't say a word. Don't do it. How many mornings did you wake up with a zero? You feel fabulous. Don't say a thing after that. And they will stutter and hesitate, and the condition will tell them what to say to take you off track. Like, oh, I'm a dental assistant, and I have tension. Of course I have headaches. On the days that I have a, the days that he makes me work longer sometimes, I'll have a headache. And, or, you know, back in 1983, I was in a car accident, so sometimes, well, when I get my worst, no. How many mornings a week do you wake up with a zero? wait. The longer the hesitation and the more rationalization that precedes the answer, the closer you are. What if they admit, like, I don't know, usually I'm, you know, I don't know, maybe two or three. 
And they're like, I don't know, maybe even four. Like, so there. Like, four morning, I feel fabulous. And I say, then immediately reverse it and say, so three mornings a week you wake up with a number. Now, right now, that condition is trying to convince you to back off and redirect your, your questioning. So you, and you never ask a chronic headache patient or one you suspect how often they have headaches. How intense are their headaches? Because they love to talk about that. They don't talk about when they don't have a headache. That's, they have to really think about that one. So you wake up with a number, you wake up with a zero, oh good, three or four mornings. So three or four mornings a week you wake up with a number. Well, what's the average number you might have upon waking? I don't know, three, four maybe. Would it shock you to wake up with a six? Has that ever happened to you? Would that just be totally weird? No. So you've gone from someone who's going to tell you, oh, no, it's, that's, that's not so bad, to someone who would not, to wake up with a six would not be weird to them. I think that's really weird. <laughs> but you can't, but to that patient, it's not. That's normal. That's usual and customary because they haven't told their neurologist about it yet. They haven't told anybody about it yet because every time they turn on the TV, there's a commercial for Excedrin or Tylenol or Motrin. It's the headache medicine. It's the new migraine things or whatever. That's part of life. At the supermarket, there's an aisle for headache remedies. So if it's normal, why, why report it? As, uh, they don't want to tell you that they're abnormal because they're like everybody else. They'll be unresponsive to typical medications. They'll have an unremarkable typical history of TMD that no one's been able to help or fix. So here's something from Dr. Dawson's website. After every occlusal treatment of any kind, I ask every patient to close and clench as hard as they can. Why would you do that? Because it does not happen during function. No one chews food like this. I asked them to grit their teeth and grind in all directions. I think we're treating for parafunction. If they can elicit any kind of discomfort, I know I'm not finished because when I have complete harmony with CR, all the teeth are touching when the condyle is at its most superior position. This is assuming parafunction. He's getting ready for parafunction. He's replicating parafunction. It is impossible for the patient to feel discomfort in the joint. Dentistry is the art and science from here down. We stipulate, we stipulate parafunction. We stipulate occluding. It's our business. The moment you get him to grind as hard as he can, grind sideways, he needs immediate posterior disclusion. Why? He doesn't want a unilateral posterior contact with a translated condyle while elevation is still happening because it makes your joint hurt. The moment he can get posterior disclusion right now, when someone grinds as hard as they can to the side, he knows the condyle must have dropped down from CR. That's how these posteriors can disclude so quickly. You don't have to rely on the canine.